Hello, it's Scott Manley here, and as you probably know, I was in Hawaii last week and amazing things were happening, and of course, Hawaii is home to some of the world's biggest and best telescopes, so I made a point of getting in touch with people in the astronomy world who could show me a few things. And yes, I have a few videos, and we're going to start with not the top of the mountain, because actually for most of my trip, the mountain was basically not like this, it was more like this. But the truth is that thanks to modern technology, while the telescopes are still at the top of the mountain, the control rooms are down at the bottom. And while there were no astronomers working on account of it being bad weather and daylight, I did get to hang out in the Gemini control room. Oh! We're at uh, the Gemini, Gemini, Gemini control room for uh, for Mauna Kea. Mm -hmm. So Gemini, two telescopes, right? Yes. So we're called Gemini for a reason. We have twin telescopes, uh, one here uh, on Mauna Kea on the Big Island of Hawaii, and another twin telescope uh, on Serapuchon in Chile. So they can work together, or uh, if one is out of is mm -hmm. visibility is bad, you can do get data from the other one. How's the weather in Chile right now? The weather in Chile is a little bit. Better, I think they're in fall right now. Okay. They're in the southern hemisphere, so it's been looking a little bit better. Unfortunately for us, the weather's been kind of bad, so we've been closed for most of the nights in the past couple. Ah, uh, yeah. I noticed the winds were ninety miles an hour last night. Yes. But uh, hopefully, <laughs> hopefully we'll get a chance to get up there today. But uh, yeah, I mean, this is this is great because you do all your operations remotely. Nobody goes up to the top of the mountain because yeah. that's how how high is that? 14,000 feet, about 4,200 meters. 4,200. So that's, you know, atmosphere is a bit thinner there, and you want your astronomers to be on tip top form. Yes. So um, as of late 2015, uh, we moved all of our oper operations remote. So there's no one up at the summit. Um, it's kind of nice for them. There's more oxygen. It's a little bit warmer. They don't have to drive so far. And um, yeah, they get to observe right here in Hilo. Same uh, in Chile, they get to observe from Macedonia. So they can observe and go diving on the same day, which you yes, couldn't they can. use to do, right? Because <laughs> the pressure difference would be major. So, Gemini, what's, uh, what's been up to before the weather ruined things? <laughs> what, what cool things happened have been ha in the news lately? Um, well, the most recent press release we put out was um, we, detected, we detected a galaxy that had no dark matter and actually jasmine. You wrote the press release for that? Yeah, basically. <laughs> so, essentially, we found out that there was no dark matter, and it was a collaboration by a lot of different telescopes. So, we had images from the Hubble telescope. We got, we saw that there were these weird, bright sources, and we were trying to figure out what these weird, bright sources were. So Keck looked at these sources and then saw that they're actually globular clusters. So you're looking at the orbital velocity of these mm -hmm. globular clusters. And in most galaxies, the rotation curve doesn't go as you would expect for the amount of matter that's there. So we infer that there must be dark matter. But for this galaxy, they were moving really, really slowly, mm -hmm. right? You, there was no evidence of dark matter. Yeah, so it, then it shows that all of the mass that was in this galaxy can be accounted for by the stars and gas that are in the system. That you can see. In fact, we can actually see right through this galaxy right. to other galaxies behind it. It's so transparent. But that paradoxically, by finding a galaxy without any dark matter, this lends evidence that dark yeah. matter is actually a thing. Because dark matter then can be separated from galaxies, so it shows that it's own entity who can make its own decisions. Yes, there are many people that come up with theories that say that maybe gravity, maybe the theory of gravity is wrong and that there's some sort of a fall off in the force over distance that would explain this, but in this case that doesn't work. So great points for dark matter, less points for the other theories, let's say. <laughs> so anything else that Gemini's been up to? Um, so I don't know if you guys heard, but um, LIGO detected uh, yes. Those two neutron stars that collided, and so we were one of 70 observatories that uh, got to observe that event, so that was really... So you got the notification from the gravity, from the network, yes. and you pointed the telescope, and you interrupted whatever you were doing. <laughs> yep. And so. there was an optical counterpart to that, yes. Yes. which was, yeah, mm -hmm. we'd previously seen gravity waves, gravitational waves, mm -hmm. But this was the first time there was an optical counterpart observed. First time there was an optical counter counterpart, and the first time that we were able to observe the source event. And so, you did you get spectra here, or um, we did get some spectra because that was critical 
for yes. actually yeah. seeing yeah. the decayed products mm -hmm. and showing that this was a pair of neutron stars. Mm -hmm. Because they, they collided and the huge neutron fluxes were able to create these very, very heavy elements. Right, so now we can finish our periodic table, we some know. textbook changing stuff, which is really cool. <laughs> yeah, because we didn't know before this event where some of the heavy metals came from. We knew that supernova could create some of them, but we couldn't quite get the levels of neutron fluxes that we needed. And colliding neutron stars give us that avenue. For Gemini, we do something called Q observing. So classical observing, right, we'll have the astronomers come here, they take their data, but if the weather's been kind of crappy like it has been. Because it's been really bad. It's been it's, pretty bad. <laughs> it's just foggy, mm -hmm. and it's rainy. Foggy, winds, icy. rain, snow, ice, all that good stuff. For classical observing, if an astronomer comes down and the weather's like that, too bad, so sad, you don't get your data, but we do some. But you do get a vacation in Hawaii. I, yeah. Sure. <laughs> if you get the grant money. <laughs> yes. We're able to place your program in certain bands. So band four is like poor weather. Band one is like excellent conditions. And so, you know, if we miss a night, it's not too bad. We can just reschedule you for another night. In the semester. As long as the observation exactly. isn't constrained exactly. by time. Yes. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, when you're making a grant application for telescope time, sometimes your observations don't need the best visibility or the best seeing. They can work with a, perhaps a, mount, a certain amount of haze or turbulent air. And if you can accept these conditions, it means you're more likely to get your telescope time so you can write your papers. Yeah. And what's nice about Mount Ikea um, is it is 14,000 feet, so it's above the inversion layer, all the telescopes. And so usually, more often than not, the clouds stay nice and below about 9,000 feet. <laughs> <laughs> so this is the weather upstairs uh, up there right now? Yes. So what did it say? Humidity, 99%. Yeah. <laughs> that would well, explain the haze. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, wind speed, uh, those are in meters per second, I guess? Yes. Yes, because uh, they've just closed the road again. Yeah. Well, anyway, yeah, I don't know if I'm going to get up there anywhere near it, but maybe later in the week, who knows? So, Christy, you drive the telescope. Yes, yes. Right, so this is... The mirror is big, it's like, what's it, eight meters? Eight meters, eight meters, meters across. Meters. So how heavy is that thing, and how does it feel to drive something like that? <laughs> I don't actually have to lift it. It's <laughs> nice. It does all the lifting for me, so <laughs> I just have to click a few buttons. And oh, I see. So it's not a case of, like, picking up the joystick and slewing it around no, until you get close I wish. to that part. <laughs> that sounds fun. <laughs> so. so the kind of things you have to pay attention to are things like you have to get electrical power in, so there's probably limits and things like that? Um, I don't have to monitor it completely, but um, we have this uh, good symbol up there <laughs> that will change to bad if something like that were, were to... I'm fuzzy on the whole good-bad thing. What do you mean bad? Yeah, I mean, what's the worst that can happen if you don't <laughs> drive? Well, if you drive drunk, you know, don't do that. But if you, what's the worst that could happen? The mirror could fall off. The mirror could fall off. <laughs> <I guess. laughs> If you don't think, do things right yet. Okay, <laughs> that, that sounds pretty really yeah. bad. <laughs> Thanks to all of you. Uh, I, I really hope I you know, would love to see this properly someday. But, um... <laughs> Thanks for coming. Come, please come back when the weather is nicer. <laughs> yes. Well, the weather is fantastic down here. This is true.